So thank you so much for having me. It's an incredible honor to be here, and I hope I do justice to that honor now. So I want to start by setting some expectations. So this talk isn't actually a comprehensive look at all the different reasons that we might um, protect uh, dangerous megafauna. It's actually more about the complicated relationship that wildlife conservation has with evidence and logic. And I want to explore this, this area in two parts. Um, the first part, I, in the first part, I want to talk about what I have come to see as an ecological mythology, a set of reasons that we as conservationists put forth to uh, justify the conservation of wildlife that doesn't necessarily stand up to scrutiny. And then in the last 10 minutes or so of my talk, I want to talk about a neglected truth, a reason that maybe should be more central to why we conserve wildlife. So I first started really thinking hard about whether we should be conserving dangerous animals at all when I was reading Amartya Sen's Development as Freedom. And for Dr. Sen, the plight of honey collectors that lived on the outside of the Sundarbans was a key example of the desperation of poverty. He talked about how even though they knew that there were tigers in the forests where they collected honey, they had to go in there and risk their lives anyway. He said in a good year, only about 50 or so honey gatherers are killed by tigers, but that number can be very much higher. While the tigers are protected, Nothing protects the miserable human beings who try to make a living by working in these woods. And of course, that problem isn't just in the Sundarbans. Uh, a woman named Nanki Devi at the age of 55 was with her four sons farming in, uh, in agricultural lands outside of Pilibi Tiger Reserve when a tigress sauntered out, grabbed Nanki Devi by the throat, and dragged her into the jungle and killed her. And of course, you know, this is just a story until you kind of try to put yourself in that place. You're just farmers. And this is your mother, your sister, your daughter, who for some inexplicable reason has been killed by a tiger. There were 19 such deaths in Pilibit in 2018 alone. And across the country, we, the official records say there are about 40 to 50 deaths a year. Some tiger ex experts I've spoken to think that the number is actually higher. Now, in some ways, what happens in India is very different from what's happened in the rest of the world. In, in places like China, Japan, Europe, the United States, as, as societies have gained enough resources, they've quickly moved to exterminate the kind of animals that could actually threaten human life. But in India, a democratic republic nonetheless, the Indian government this year is spending about 300 crore rupees to help protect tigers. And so the natural question is, why are we doing this? Given how dangerous tigers are to human life, why not just let tigers go extinct and help protect some of the most marginalized peoples in our society. Now, the reason I see most often given to justify tiger conservation is captured in, this, in the plaque under this photo that you, you could find in the uh, lobby of WF India's office in, in New Delhi. And it says, the tiger perishes without the forest, and the forest perishes without its tigers. And there's more detail given on the WF India website which says the tiger is not just a charismatic species or just another wild animal living in some faraway forest. The tiger keeps populations of wild ungulates in check, thereby maintaining the balance between herbivores and the vegetation upon which they feed. The extinction of the top predator is an indication that its ecosystem would not long exist thereafter. And WF India has not come up with this claim themselves. They've taken it from other institutions. So you can find the same essential claim in a report by the UN Environmental Program, in uh, the Hindu, the Indian Express, um, in, on the Wildlife Cons Conservation Society of India's website, right? And so the implicit claim being made about tiger conservations, as far as I read it, is this. Yes, it's truly tragic that tigers force us to kind of curtail the livelihood opportunities of people living in and around tiger reserves, it's tragic that they sometimes lose livestock. It's especially tragic that they sometimes take human life. But unfortunately, these costs are needed for us to maintain tigers in the ecosystems so that tigers can help make sure that we still have forests, right? The costs are necessary to maintain an ecological whole and system. And in some ways, it's kind of analogous to how we might see people dying from automobile accidents, right? Obviously, no one wants that to happen. It's horrible when people die in, in car wrecks. However, it seems as though we need automobiles in order to have a functioning economic system. So naturally, a good thing to do when you have a claim like this is to examine it. 
is it actually true that, as the Hindu says, in the absence of tigers, our forests would essentially disappear? So I've been working in Indian conservation now for about 15 years, and I've never actually seen a paper that looks at this claim closely. Um, none of the folks I cited in an earlier slide had a a provided a reference that demonstrated this claim. Um, and if you just look at the maps of forest cover in Asia and the tiger range in Southeast Asia, they don't really match up very well. But I'm not a tiger expert. So I asked my colleagues who are in the tiger conservation program at WWF if they know of any knew of any literature that actually substantiates this claim. And uh, one of my colleagues sort of said, you know, I don't really know of any either, but here's the best I, I know of. And he sent me a picture, uh, sorry, he sent me a, a document written by Thinley et al. in 2018, and it's from Bhutan. And the central finding of that paper is that in places where there are tigers, leopards and doles, wild dogs, are more likely to hunt outside of the forest, and therefore ungulates crop raid less, right? So basically, it's some sign that tigers might be functionally consequential. But as an evidence base for the main claim that we see everywhere, there are a lot of problems, right? First of all, the finding of this paper is different than the claim. Right? The, the, the paper doesn't find that tigers actually help protect forests from being overbrowsed. But there's an even deeper problem here. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on tiger conservation. So you would think that you know, there would be not just one, two, maybe a dozen papers that establish this as a fact that tigers are necessary for forests if that's actually a central motivation for tiger conservation. And the problem gets a little deeper when you just think about what else we know about tigers and think about it logically. So as many of you know, in the 1970s, India really started getting serious about tiger conservation. And in the 90s and early 2000s, by the 90s and early 2000s, you know, eminent ecologists like Dr. Ulas Karanth and his colleagues had really tried to figure out what is keeping tigers from recovering where they have habitat. And in several places, including Melgad Tiger Reserve, Pench, Tadoba, Badra, what they found was it wasn't that there was a shortage of habitat or there wasn't necessarily even too much poaching of tigers. The main issue they thought was that there wasn't enough, there weren't enough herbivores, enough prey for the tigers to eat. And the reason they thought that there weren't enough prey is in part because of anthropogenic, dis because of anthropogenic dis uh, disturbances, including livestock grazing, but also human overhunting. So now think about this. If human hunters are able to keep herbivore numbers so low that tigers can't even survive, why do we need tigers to keep the herbivore numbers low and uh, allow forest regeneration? And the truth is that, especially in the modern age, when there's so many people and we have so many modern weapons at our disposal, human hunters are more efficient than tigers. So if you really wanted to just regulate herbivore numbers to allow regeneration, then instead of boxing people out of the reserves, we might have just regulated their hunting. They would have gotten some meat out of the deal, and we wouldn't have had to deal with man-eating tigers. Right? So this is what I mean by an ecological myth. The idea that tigers are indispensable is, at best, a half-true story we tell the public to justify conserving wildlife. And once you start looking for these myths, you see them everywhere. So for instance, some of you might be among the 44 million people who've watched this video on YouTube called How Wolves Change Rivers. And the claim is that when wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone National Park in the US, they created this landscape of fear. And that made it less likely that elk would come in and eat aspen saplings near the side of the river. Because of that, aspen trees grew to their full size, and beavers are now able to use that wood from the aspen trees to make dams and literally change the course of rivers. And it's a really nice story. The problem is that when scientists have gone and tried to replicate these findings, they've, first of all, been unable to replicate it and also found severe logical flaws, like that the authors discounted the fact that hunting levels had gone up at about the same time. And in one review, the scientists write, our view is that the most robust science suggests trophic cascades, the, the downstream effects of wolves, are not evident in Yellowstone. Another example is sharks. So many shark conservationists make a claim similar to what the Shark Research Unit does. Uh, they're an NGO in South Africa uh, on their website. They say because sharks are one of the ocean's apex predators, they keep the numbers of fish lower in the food chain in check. And somehow, through a series of ch uh, cause and effect, this means that without sharks, coral reefs can't compete and will cease to survive. 
But then a review done by Chin and Beerwagon in 2018, they're from James Cook University, found that there's no strong evidence that sharks are keystone species. And coral reef habitats are very complex, and the research and findings on the role of sharks are often contradictory, and claims are highly contested. In other words, at best, this is not settled science. So that's the carnivores. And no talk on this issue would be complete without discussing elephants, the arguably um, the, de the deadliest wild mammal in India. As many of you know, the Gudja report in 2010 said that about 500,000 families a year are affected by crop raiding by elephants, which for a marginal farmer can be a, a real problem. Sometimes elephants break into homes, which can lead to pervasive trauma for the victims who live in those homes thereafter. In 2010, the Gudja report estimated that about 400 people a year were killed by elephants and now um, reports suggest that it's more like 500 people a year. Uh, just to give a human example, one of my temporary drivers in Buxar Tiger Reserve when I was working there uh, told me about how uh, uh, a particularly malicious elephant knocked down the wall of his home looking for stuff. The wall fell on his mother-in-law, killed her. Then the elephant picked up his four-year-old son, threw him on the road, and he died as well. So again, what is our justification for working to protect animals that harm our fellow humans? And again, some of the most marginalized people in our society who have enough problems already. So the claim for Asian elephants is that they are a keystone species. In, that, in the essence that the things that they do are really important for other species to survive and, and perhaps the ecosystem as a whole. Um, the, the mechanisms by, with, by which elephants are thought to be keystone species are more diverse than for tigers. So I have them listed here. It said that they open forest clearings, they create microhabitats, but perhaps the one that's given the most attention is the role that Asian elephants play in dispersing seeds. The idea being that because Asian elephants can eat a lot of fruit, because they don't chew their food a lot and they can swallow seeds whole, because they move far away from the parent tree and they leave seeds with a big heap of fertilizer, that elephants are particularly good as seed dispersers in a way that other animals simply can't replicate. And sort of the, the stark version of this ecological claim that comes from this keystone, keystone species narrative uh, is vo was voiced by, by the great ecologist, Pedro Giordano. And he said in an interview with The Wire, when talking about a seed dispersal study, frugivores like the elephants guarantee the persistence of the park. If the interactions documented by these researchers would vanish, then the whole forest would collapse. Um, and so this is again, kind of like an, some existential story, right? That without elephants, the forest might cease to exist. And in the interest of full disclosure, I've said stuff like this too, right? But now, let's look at the evidence. So, Elephants are actually pretty good seed dispersers. Um, Campos Arcias and Blake found that Asian elephants disperse about 122 species of uh, plant from 39 families. And there are a few examples that demonstrate that in the absence of elephants, other species wouldn't be able to disperse these, species, these seeds as well. So my own PhD research was done in Buxar Tiger Reserve. And I looked at three, the three species that you see on the right. And we found that in the absence of elephants, we did ecological data and modeling, we found that without elephants, Delinea indica would have only about 60% as many, sorry, 60% fewer seeds dispersed without elephants than when elephants were around. Um, whereas Artocarpus chiplasha would only uh, lose about 9% of the number of seeds dispersed. However, the quality of dispersal also changes. So for Artocarpus chiplasha, the median seed in a world without elephants would only go about 10% as far as it would in a, in a world with elephants, right? So elephants help get seeds to more places than would happen without them. Another study by Kim McConkey um, in Thailand found that for Platymithero macrocarpa, elephants are actually responsible for 37% of the seedlings that actually were successfully dispersed. So it's not nothing. Elephants are doing something, it seems, as seed dispersers. But when we get to the question of would their absence really matter for the forest, for the ecosystem, in a way that we would notice, it becomes harder to make stronger claims. First of all, it's hard to account for dynamic systems. These species are evolving and they have you know, complex partnerships with other species as well. So Delinea indica, the one that relies on elephants for some 60% you know, of its seed dispersed, um, actually has a mechanism by which if the fruit isn't eaten by an elephant when it's hard, 
it gets softer over time. And then you know, smaller animals like rats or squirrels or macaques can access the seeds and potentially disperse them. And you can imagine that without elephants, this species would just evolve so that it relies even more on smaller species for its dispersal. An example of that was actually found empirically in Brazil, where um, the absence of toucans led to the rapid evolution of smaller seed sizes uh, in, for, for several species. But perhaps an even more interesting question comes from looking at what's happened in the, Amer in the Americas in general. As many of you know, about 10 to 12,000 years ago, the New World lost most of its would-be charismatic megafauna, ground sloths, mammoths, and, this, and so forth. And yet, several large fruited species that are classified as needing megafauna to, to disperse them have survived 12,000 years, like the Kentucky coffee tree or the Osage orange. In one study by a researcher named Jansen, he found that the species Astrocarium standalianum was actually being dispersed by you know, 10 to 15 kilogram agoutis, rodents, that would take the seeds, bury them, and then sometimes they'd steal the seeds from other, other animals and then bury them elsewhere. In the process, we're dispersing them you know, over a kilometer. And so what he wrote in his paper is that it's conceivable that the secondary seed dispersal of these seeds by rodents can be sufficiently effective to substitute for primary dispersal of megafaunal seeds by large mammals, and perhaps these plants never depended on megafauna in the first place. But perhaps the, um, well, and also just to say, you don't, when you look at the Amazon, you don't think that it's not a vibrant forest, right? Even though they haven't had megafauna for so long. But perhaps the sort of most compelling counter argument to the Keystone narrative, to me, came from my friend in Buxa Tiger Reserve, uh, Tireatri. So I was opening uh, elephant dung looking for seeds one day, and he asked me why I was doing that. And I explained to him this hypothesis, that Asian elephants were particularly important for dispersing seeds in Buxa. And his response was, that's why you want elephants. But yeah, pay us a little, and we'll plant your seeds for you. Right? And he went on to make two points. First of all, from his perspective, as a villager who's had an elephant break into his kitchen, who loses 50, 75% sometimes of his yield two elephants, who has actually had neighbors killed by elephants. The idea that the seed dispersal by elephants is a good enough reason to keep them around is kind of absurd, right? But he's also kind of making another point implicitly. Just as hunters can replace tigers, villagers who want to plant trees could probably replace elephants as seed dispersers. As many of you know, in many of our tiger reserves, including Buxa, much of the forest was actually planted during the plantation era you know, um, under the British and, and thereafter. And, and there's actually an interesting study done in Crow Wildlife Reserve in Malaysia, where they were in this area, indigenous peoples actually plant fruit gardens in the middle of the forest. And so these researchers went to see what's the mammal density in the indigenous planted, planted forest gardens compared to the, to the so-called natural forest. And there were three times more mammals more mammal biomass in the planted forests. So what I've come to sort of accept um, over time is that megafauna are, you know, whether they're deadly or not, might in some situations, in some times, in some places, play a really useful role ecologically, useful from our perspective, um, and they might even be irreplaceable in some contexts. And that's sort of the general vibe that you get from reading about wolves or sharks as well. But their importance is so contextual that it's not really fair for us to make large sweeping claims that without them, ecosystems will collapse, especially because given their low abundances and our omnipresence and our increasing technological abilities, in a pinch, if we really miss something that they're doing, we can probably stand in for them. So we lack evidence that charismatic megafauna prevent disaster. So why do we, as a community, continue to make these tall claims? So, so my feeling is that megafauna and biodiversity inspire us as conservationists, right? They enrich our lives, they enrich our cultures, and we really just can't imagine, we don't want to imagine a world without them. But in this utilitarian society, we feel that the only way we can get society to make this, you know, sufficient compromises and sacrifices to save megafauna is by invoking existential ecological threats. Nothing, you know, saying that you know, they make us feel good isn't gonna be good enough. 
And in addition, I think, it, at least for me, it's been hard to accept that conservation might just be about aesthetics and our preferences as elites. The fact that we like to go on safari, for instance, and not about some sort of deeper ethics. So what now? Well, we should be honest, first of all, about the limited evidence that megafauna play uh, in, in ecosystems. A person whose you know, relative has been killed by a tiger and elephant shouldn't have to contend with this mythology when they're protesting what's happened to them. But more importantly, we should double down as a community to really make addressing human-wildlife conflict, preventing human-wildlife conflict, the number one priority. Um, you know, boosting the numbers of these species can wait until we can make sure that our fellow humans are safe. And if you'll allow me a, a, a movement of pride at WF India, we are doing that with our elephant program. We are really trying to make sure that addressing conflict is the absolute top priority. But also there's one other thing we could do differently that might make us feel a little bit better. I actually think there is an evidence-based moral reason to save megafauna and most vertebrate species that we could make central to conservation, but that we've ignored. And this reason I've found is actually reflected in the voices of people I've spoken to in Tamil Nadu, Kerala, North Bengal, Assam. And it goes something like this. Everywhere I go, I ask people who've suffered in some way from, from work living with elephants, what they feel about the idea of just removing those elephants or even you know, killing the elephants, having the state kill the elephants that are causing them so much trouble. And one person, Sonpur Assam said, you know, the elephants too, they're not at fault. Their forests where they used to live are no more. They don't have a place to live. They don't have enough food for their stomach. They too have a problem. And just like we get hungry, they have to take someone else's food in a pinch. You know, that's the thing. And what's interesting here is that people who speak in this way, and, and well, you know, people give different answers to the question. Uh, at every place I've been, someone has said something like this. Um, and when they say, when they speak this way, they're essentially shifting the burden of proof. They're using a different ethical framework than I've set out so far. Instead of asking, what benefits do humans get from this species? And do those benefits outweigh the cost? They're thinking, this is a creature with needs and wants that I can relate to. I can sympathize with it. Do we have a good enough reason to harm that creature? And in, in essence, they're going away from an anthropocentric perspective, and they're thinking of these fellow creatures as animals with, with feelings, needs, with a well-being to be looked after. And you know, while rural Indians often view animals as thinking and feeling individuals, this is not the norm in wildlife conservation across the world internationally. Um, and I, I think this is basically because of the history of, of Western science in the last several hundred years. Until recently, Western science basically thought the very idea of comparing human and non-human mental states was absurd. So they had some legitimate concerns. Some scientists would claim that they could understand a talking horse, for instance, or sorry, the horse could understand them. That would have been even worse. Um, but they, they, they acted as though animals could understand human language. Um, but they kind of then took it too far. So one, one commentator described uh, Rene Descartes' view on animals with a quote below. Um, Descartes basically believed that animals were like machines. They didn't have thoughts, they didn't have feelings. Animals eat without pleasure, they cry without pain, grow without knowing it, they desire nothing, fear nothing, know nothing. And, I mean, anyone who's had a, you know, a dog or a horse or lived near an elephant knows this is a pretty absurd claim. Um, and now, Western science has sort of caught up with reality, self-corrected, and not only shown us that animals can think and feel, but that they actually have abilities, you know, hard, easy, or hard, well demonstrated abilities that we might not have suspected before. And so I just want to kind of give you a sample of the mountain of evidence that's now available that a diverse cat, a set of animals can think and feel. So for instance, there's evidence of tool use in chimps, chimpanzees, elephants, dolphins, crows, and even octopuses. There's evidence of novel problem solving in chimps, elephants, cockatoos, macaques, and pigs. There is evidence that animals recognize themselves in the mirror, including chimps, orangutans, Asian elephants, magpies, and dolphins. Several studies have shown that some animals actually have an idea of whether they have enough information to understand whether they can solve a problem, a concept called metacognition. Those species include dolphins, macaques, and rats. 
There is evidence that Western scrub jays and chimpanzees plan ahead for the next day. There's evidence that capuchin monkeys have a sense of fairness. And there's also evidence that jays, dolphins, rats, and elephants actually share, have a sense of empathy. And that's just the behavioral science. There's actually, or the behavior ecology, there's actually a whole lot more. When you get into the neurosciences, there's a surprising amount of consensus that all studied mammals share seven emotional systems, including joy, fear, grief, parental nurturance, and playfulness. Which means that if you stimulate the homologous, homologous part of our brain and the brain of, say, a rat, they react with the same behaviors that you would expect associated with that emotion. And more recently, researchers have found that birds also demonstrate similar emotional states and, um, and consciousness. In fact, the consensus is so strong that a leading set of neuroscientists, neuropharmacologists, neurophysiologists, neuroanatomists, and computational neuroscientists got together in 2012, and they wrote the Cambridge Declaration of Unconsciousness. It's just a two-page document. I think it's fascinating reading if you want to look at it. But the, the main essence of the claim of the, of the de declaration was this. The weight of evidence indicates that humans are not unique in possessing the neurological substrates that generate consciousness. Non-human animals, including all mammals and birds, and many other creatures, including octopuses, also possess these neurological substrates. Now, just as a matter of scientific evidence, consider you know, just the, the breadth, the depth, the variety of evidence, the consensus that exists for the idea that non-human animals experience joy, sorrow, and pain. And compare that to the sort of wishy-washy, limited evidence that megafauna uh, uphold our ecosystem. The ecosystem might collapse without megafauna. Really, if you think about how much medical research has relied on the similarities between our and rats' nervous systems and endocrine systems, the, the, the mountain of evidence available that animals think and feel is similar to the mountain of evidence available that climate change is happening. So you would think then that if, if conservation organizations want a moral reason to go around trying to make the lives of animals better, they could use animal welfare arguments. But the interesting thing is that they don't. Uh, so my friend Derek Schiller and I, in preparation for this article, uh, did a little research on the 10 biggest organizations that work on biodiversity conservation in the US. The Science is a US journal. Um, and we also looked at the IUCN and the Society for Conservation Biology. And what we did is we looked at their mission statements, their vision statements, all available policy documents online, and the first 50 things that came up when we looked up animal welfare and the name of the organization and, and similar things. And what we found is that none of these organizations have mentioned animal welfare in their mission or vision statements, <clears throat> nor do any of them have a comprehensive policy related to animal welfare. Greenpeace and the Sierra Club did have one or two projects or specific policies related to animal welfare, and about you know, half a dozen, seven or so organizations at some point in the, in, the, in, the, in the world of the internet, say something sort of positive about animal welfare. So, so for instance, um, the WWF, uh, ha it, Pakistan had a policy against having cetaceans in captivity. So why don't they include animal welfare as a policy? And I'm not actually saying that animal welfare needs to become the central pillar of conservation. But conservation organizations did have a bunch of other policies like avoiding corruption, multiculturalism, uh, prohibition of unnecessary travel, anti-gossip, anti-human trafficking, and fraud. Uh, the IUCN has a specialty group on business, finance, and economics. Given how relevant animal welfare is to, to the world of animals and how much conservation works on animals, why isn't animal welfare a topic? Um, and I have to wrap up, so I'm going to go a little faster here. But I think the main reason is because it would be really hard for us. It's not a simple argument to say that animals are thinking, feeling creatures and we should protect them, because there's some really big trade-offs that come with, with, with understanding that. So for instance, harming animals is necessary for subsistence hunters, or if we have a real overpopulation problem in an ecosystem. And so conservation as, an, or as a society would have to come up with a good way to navigate those trade-offs. In addition, what science has found is that all mammals and birds including invasive rabbits and feral dogs and cats, have the ability to think and feel. And so essentially an acknowledging animal consciousness would place an extra burden on, on, on conservationists when it comes to trying to predict biodiversity. 
also many of our donors are hunters and so talking about you know, the maybe the ethical problems of recreational hunting could hurt our bottom line but i think the most fundamental problem is that we ourselves as conservationists do things that aren't very good for animals very few of us are careful about making sure that the meat the dairy the eggs we consume come from animals that were treated ethically at least as long as they were alive and you know there's a big difference between traditional yak farming a life good for the yaks and the and, and this factory farming so change is tough and because maybe we're not ready to change our own behavior we're reluctant to embrace the science that could really justify what we want to do but i really think that you know this is the best path we can go down nothing is as exciting to me as the idea that we are surrounded by animals that think that feel that have emotional experiences that have lives that we can commune with and that they're not just machines and i think conservationists are uniquely suited to try and navigate the trade-offs that come with acknowledging animal welfare is a serious moral concern. We work in villages, we work in boardrooms, we understand the pragmatic realities that we have to consider in trying to make change. So I hope together, uh, through empathy and analysis, we can make conservation more about uh, a world of both wonder and well-being for humans and non-humans. Thank you. <laughs>